Gracious Father, we thank you for the book of Jeremiah and your servant Jeremiah, a man who had an amazing ministry that both challenges, inspires, and disturbs. And Lord, as we come to look at this seventh chapter, uh, we pray that your spirit would speak its truth afresh into our hearts this day. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Um, the first car that I owned was a red 1972 Datsun 1600. And I was quite amazed that there was a picture on the web that actually was matched my car. <laughs> um, when I bought it, uh, which was in the last days of uni, I, I thought it was a very cool car. One of the earliest cars with an independent rear end, which is why it was very popular for rally car driving. Four-speed manual gearbox, and all my mates were into rally cars, gave it the big thumbs-up stamp of approval and said, yep, it's a cool car to have. Um, when I drove it home from the uh, car yard, it was, I guess, a very nervous drive because it's been a while since I'd driven a manual, and I had to remind ourselves how you did that. But we made it safely, and I was a very proud owner of my own set of wheels. Over the next few months, I discovered that my great pride and joy was not all that it appeared to be when I bought it. Uh, the left rear panel was more plastic filler than metal. Uh, the car radio was rather insipid. The headlights were like dull torches at night. Uh, the heater didn't work very well. Uh, the rear window demister didn't work at all. Uh, the driver's seat had a dodgy weld in it, in the frame, and the engine leaked oil. Well, the initial image was a bit deceptive. Over the next 18 months, I embarked on a mission to transform my car. So I installed a new car stereo and speakers, though the speakers didn't quite fit the holes in the back of the steel shelf, so a bit of a brutal panel beating took place to make them fit. Uh, I replaced the Lucas headlights with some halogen headlights. I replaced the rear window demister with one that worked. I uh, put a manual heater tap in the engine place so that the heater would work. I even tried my hand at body repair by replacing more of the rust with more plastic filler. And then I eventually replaced the 1600cc engine with an 1800cc engine, which didn't quite fit. It left a little mound on top of the bonnet where it hit the top of the rocket cover. Now, with all those changes, you would think that my Datsun 1600 would be a great car. But most of the changes were cosmetic. And while driving it was a lot of fun, uh, the basic structure of the car remained the same. Uh, my girlfriend, who would later become my wife, uh, laughed at my car, and still does, uh, refused to drive it. Uh, the large steering wheel made it feel like she was driving a bus, and the wobbly gear stick thought she was stirring porridge when she was trying to change gears. So she refused to drive it much to her loss, I think. My Datsun survived the first couple of years of our marriage, but eventually had to go. On the outside, it may have looked like a cool rally car. It was a bit fun to drive, but it was structurally deficient. Uh, it struggled to fulfill the purpose for which it was designed, and it tended to make a more negative than a positive contribution to our married life. In the years since, we have learned that function overrides looks when it comes to cars. Uh, it's a lesson I think we are reminded of every time we rent a car on holidays. Because you go there and you go, wow, it looks like a cool looking car. And then it drives like a brick on four wheels. And you go, what a lemon. Who'd want that? Now, our Western culture, our consumer culture, places a big emphasis on image. Now, you see that in car marketing, where often, you know, it's the, the number of cup holders get all the emphasis and not how the car actually drives. Uh, in the fashion industry, you know, practicality is often ignored, all for the purposes of setting a strident image. And the focus on image is also linked its way into how churches market themselves on their web pages. If you ever go looking through church web pages, you know, beautiful images are provided of worship and the ministries the church operates. Images of the facilities and the buildings highlight how comfortable the church is. 
information highlights, you know, how large or how cutting edge they may be or how important their church is. And the expectation is that these images of the church are what people are looking for in a church. Uh, and they are images of what being a church is all about, looking good and looking great. Over the past 100 years, Western societies have watched the number of people who profess the Christian faith shrink quite dramatically. Here in Australia, uh, back in 1921, the census said that 96.9% of Australians designated themselves as Christian. In 1991 census, that figure was down to 74%. And in the most recent census in 2021, that figure is now down to 43.9%. In terms of how many people actually attend church, the 2021 census reckons about 21% attend church. And that's on the basis of attending church just once a month. And so in terms of regular attenders, the percentage is even lower, probably down to 17, 15%. Now, it appears that while the marketing images of churches have become more sophisticated, they are not leading to more people coming into the church. It suggests that the church has an image problem. But the problem lies not in the images being projected across the marketplace. The problem lies in the lack of substance behind the images. You know, people today are looking for authentic community. But too often in a church, all they find is a superficial facade of niceness and religious behaviour. You know, if we as a church are to be attractive to people outside in our community, then we need to be living an authentic community life that reflects the truth of God and which lives out the love and grace of God. Because anything less will be a church offering an empty shell of religious imagery that has no substance to offer. Now, when we turn to our passage in Jeremiah this morning, we need to be aware of the historical context in order to fully appreciate this confronting sermon that Jeremiah preaches to those who are coming to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. Because what Jeremiah preaches against in this passage is worship that is an empty facade with no authentic substance. And as such, I think it is a sermon for today as much as it was in the time of Jeremiah. Now, in terms of the history of the kingdom of Judah, uh, just to give you a bit of context and historical context, Hezekiah, who reigned from 715 to 686 BC, was one of its great kings, and he was recognised as one of the few righteous kings of Judah. When he died in 686 BC, Manasseh, his son, took over. He reigned for 55 years. Unlike his father, Manasseh embraced every evil practice that existed in the ancient Near East and was without doubt the worst king the people of Judah ever had. He corrupted the temple worship, even sacrificed his own son, as well as encouraging all manner of occultic practices in the nation. And if you want to read a brief summary of what he got up to, it's there in 2 Kings chapter 21, not the most edifying report of kingship. When Manasseh finally died in 642 BC, his son Amon became king. And he sadly followed in his father's footsteps and maintained the evil and corrupt behavior of his father. As a king, Amon only lasted two years. Everyone was sick and tired of him. So he was assassinated by palace officials after two years. His son Josiah then became king at the ripe old age of eight years of age. And to the surprise of everyone, considering what his father and his grandfather had been like, Josiah was a king who was committed to being a righteous king. And his work of renewal started with cleaning out the temple, during which the priest discovered the book of Deuteronomy. And reading through the laws of God, Josiah was driven with a passion to purge his kingdom of every trace of evil practice that his grandfather and father 
had introduced. And under Josiah, the temple once more became a central focus for the worship of God. The religious feasts and the worship life of the nation was reinvigorated. And to the outsider who was looking into the kingdom of Judah, it appeared that it was having a profound experience of spiritual renewal. And such was the renewal of the temple worship that the people of Judah then claimed that their fervent worship was evidence of God's unending commitment, the ongoing existence of the temple. Now, when we go back to Jeremiah, we need to recognise that where he fits in terms of this challenging history of the kingdom of Judah. Well, Jeremiah was born in the last decade of Manasseh's reign. And so he grew up experiencing the worst that Manasseh had generated in the kingdom. And then when Josiah started his reforms, Jeremiah was a part of the renewal movement and his preaching constantly challenged the people to come back to God. Now, with the impact of Josiah's reforms, we could expect Jeremiah to feel somewhat satisfied with his prophetic ministry and be ready to conclude that, well, my work is done here. The nation is back worshipping God and everything is looking good. But changing what people do in their worship does not mean that a deep spiritual renewal has taken place. Removing the public signs of evil in a society does not mean that evil has been removed from society. And the public image being presented by all of the fervent temple worship was of a religious community fulfilling its calling to be the people of God. And everything looked good. It looked fantastic. But it was superficial. By the time Josiah's reign had ended, Jeremiah had to contend with a renewal that was only skin deep. Now, we're not sure when it happened, but it suggests that sometime around 609 BC, after Josiah had died and his son Jehoiakim had taken over as the king of Judah, that Jeremiah goes to the temple gates. Now, he doesn't go to the temple gates because he thought, well, that seems like a good thing to do on this morning of worship. Jeremiah went at the call of God because God had a message for those who were coming to the temple to worship. And so imagine for a moment what it must have been like for people who were making their way to the temple to undertake their practice of worship and there standing beside the gates of the temple is Jeremiah, who is proclaiming to them all in a loud voice, hear the word of the Lord, reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Now, as an act of welcome to people coming in worship, um, the words by Jeremiah do not follow what we would expect to hear from someone standing at the door of the church. Now, how would you react on Sunday morning when you walked into that door and I just stood there and said, hey, hear the word of the Lord, you lot. Reform your ways and your actions and I will let you live in this place. Uh, some people, I guess, would be quite offended uh, and that would be the last time we would see them. They didn't come to church to be insulted or to be challenged. Well, God has Jeremiah stand at the gate to the temple and to welcome people by challenging them to reform their lives. Because these people have come to offer their worship to God. But instead of giving their worship, they are instead given to serve by God before they even enter the temple. And it's rather confronting. So why is Jeremiah needing to do this? Why is so God unimpressed? with the worship of these people. Well, when you read through the detail of Jeremiah's preaching in verses 4 to 11, there are two issues that God has a major problem with. And while they are issues that are very relevant to the people of Judah, they also confront us about the need for our own worship to be an authentic expression 
of our relationship with God. And the first thing we notice there is that there must be an authentic connection between worship and life. Now, following on from the reforms of Josiah, the people of Judah were very good at being religious in their worship at the temple. You know, they were coming every week to offer their sacrifices. They were coming regularly to worship God. And the outward appearance was they projected was they, they were a very spiritual people because look at all the religious things they are doing. But God has a major problem with their worship. You know, it wasn't that they were not regular in coming to the temple to worship. It wasn't that they were not offering enough sacrifices. And it wasn't because they were not being religious enough. You know, the people of Judah were doing all these things in spades. It was in abundance. The problem that God had with their worship is that it was totally disconnected from how they were living out the rest of their lives. You know, we use the word worship to describe the act of recognising the worth of someone. It's a word used commonly these days for any form of adoration that we give, be it to pop stars or to sporting bodies and football teams. And in the context of religious expression, worship is attributing worth to God. And so we worship God because we believe God is worthy of all our praise and our adoration for all that he is, for all he has done and all he will do. When the people of Judah came to the temple to worship God, it was to recognize that God was sovereign. And through their many sacrifices and liturgies, they sought to declare that God was sovereign and anyone watching their worship would be captured by their vision of this sovereign God. But there is one big shortcoming with the worship being offered by the people of Judah. Their worshipful declaration of the sovereignty of God in the temple was not being lived out in their daily lives. The people of Judah were effectively living a dual existence. And so while they were in the temple, they were very spiritual, they were very religious. But when they were away from the temple, their lives were a total disgrace to God. And Jeremiah provides a tragic indictment of their worship. You know, these people of the covenant are living in ways that are a total disregard for the demands of the covenant. They do not deal justly with each other. They oppress the fatherless, the widow and the foreigner. They steal, they murder, they commit adultery, they commit perjury. They follow Baal and other gods. And the tragedy is that the people think that this doesn't matter if their lives are inconsistent with their worship. And so as God's prophetic voice, Jeremiah reads the riot act to these people. If they do not change their ways, if they do not start living authentic lives for God that is consistent with their worship, then God is going to throw them out. Jeremiah shreds the lovely image of worship the people were holding on to and reveals the hollowness of all that they do because it's the spiritual hollowness that effectively makes their worship worthless. The second thing Jeremiah points out here is that worship brings with it an accountability to God. Now, Jeremiah's message from God is quite confronting, but it almost falls on deaf ears. Now, the people had no trouble at all hearing the message, but their reply to what Jeremiah had to say was to simply parrot the saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The people of Judah erroneously believed that the temple symbolized God's eternal presence amongst them, and therefore, it didn't matter what they did outside of the temple. Now, this delusional belief flowed from their distorted understanding of the covenant that God had made with David in regard to the temple. Now, they interpreted that covenant to mean that God would always unconditionally preserve his temple. 
And on this basis, they could see no need for them to change their everyday behaviour because they believed that God would always protect the temple. Now, in view of the growing threat from Babylon to their north, this blind trust in God's commitment to the temple is quite disturbing. Because instead of facing the reality of their situation and turning to God, they chose to hold to a contrived belief that somehow God is going to protect them regardless of whatever they did. Well, God's message to them through Jeremiah is a rather devastating message. Jeremiah tells them in verse 12, go and check out Shiloh and see how well that's doing. Shiloh was the sacred place for worship for the northern kingdom of Israel. Shiloh was the place where Eli and Samuel served God. And like the temple in Jerusalem, Shiloh was held to be a place that God would always protect because this was his holy ground. Well, that belief did not protect Shiloh from its destruction by the Philistine army in about 1050 BC. Now, just because it was a sacred place where the people encountered God did not mean that God would always protect it. The people of northern Israel used Shiloh for worship, but they did not allow their worship to impact their daily lives. They lived out their apostasy and immorality until God said, enough is enough. And Shiloh was destroyed. And Jeremiah's word to the people of Judah is that they need to learn that confronting lesson of Shiloh. Just because they had the temple does not mean they are protected because they're not putting their trust in God, they're putting their trust in a temple and it is a misguided trust. If you go on to read Jeremiah chapter 26, there is a narrative section that's probably the setting for what we have in chapter 7. And the narrative section tells us that when Jeremiah finished this confronting message at the gates of the temple, the priests, the temple prophets, and all the people who heard Jeremiah responded by grabbing Jeremiah and threatening to kill him. They didn't want to hear the message. Through Jeremiah, God confronted his people with a major inconsistency in their lives. In their worship, they declared God to be sovereign, but their daily lives were a declaration that God was irrelevant. The people of Judah believed that it didn't matter how they lived out their lives as long as they turned up on the weekend to worship. These people believed the image rather than looked at the hard reality that lay underneath. You know, in a few years after Jeremiah challenged the people at the temple gate, the Babylonian armies came marching through and the kingdom of Judah was conquered. And in 587 BC, the temple, which they had placed their empty hopes in, was razed to the ground and destroyed. You know, over 2,600 years, Jeremiah declared that there must be an authentic connection between worship and life. And we have now had this message for a very long time, but we still don't seem to get it. There continues to be a gulf between our worship and how we live. We express truth about God with one breath on a Sunday and then ignore it with every other breath during the week. And the tragedy is we think that no one is watching, no one is noticing. And we think we can get away with it by living two sorts of lives. But God is watching. And so is the wider community. They too are watching. You know, the desire of God is that we live authentic lives. And these are lives in which the truth of our worship is lived out in our daily lives. And these are lives in which we not only declare that Jesus is Lord in our worship, but in which we live the truth of Jesus' Lordship every day of the week. 
These are lives in which we not only uphold the love and grace of God for us, but in which we also live out that love and grace of God in all of our relationships throughout the week. Authentic lives are lives in which people can see God in how we live, not just on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday as well. Now, we talk a lot about effective mission and what we need to do to have an effective mission. Well, effective mission does not happen when we look like we are being religious. It does not happen when we use the, the right material or follow the right program. Effective mission only happens when the Christians in the church are living authentic lives for God. It's only when the worship on Sunday is lived out throughout the rest of the week. Now, the people of Judah believe that the temple would always exist because God would never let it be destroyed. And so on that basis, they tolerated behaviour within their religious community that was a denial of the truth of God. And sadly, that same sort of behaviour goes on in churches today, where Christians think that their church will always exist regardless of the behaviour that those within the church engage in. Now, any church community that does not live out the truth of its worship in its relationships with each other, it is a church community that is living on borrowed time. There must be authenticity in our worship and how we live out our daily lives because anything less is going to impact upon the mission and life of the church because all we are doing is basically presenting an empty image. You know, in this challenging society in which we live, the challenge for Christians and the church is not the challenge of you know, staying uncontaminated by the society that is around us. The challenge is to actually live an authentic life for Jesus in the midst of this society. It's the challenge of living a life of worship matched by our personal and communal ethics. It's a challenge of living out lives in which the kingdom of God, with all of its values, they are lived out with passion in both the church and in the wider community. You know, we have come this morning into this house of worship to declare that our God is sovereign, that our God is a God of love and grace. Well, let us go from this place into our community and live out the truth of those declarations. Let us not live out a superficial image of the Christian life, but live out the authentic grace-filled life that God has given us.